Hello, my name is Kelly Hodges. I'm a nutritionist, dietitian, and currently studying to be a diabetes educator. And today I'm talking to you about type 2 diabetes remission. So it's a topic I'm very excited about and um, I hope that you really enjoy it. So a quick bit of background about me. Um, so I've been in the field since 2012 and I love what I do. I'm studying at Deakin at the moment to be a diabetes educator. I founded Coastal Dietetics, which is private practice dietetics here on the Sunshine Coast. We do lots of online work and so um, all over Australia as well. I am, you can see my beautiful family there, I'm very fortunate, and then I'm pregnant at the moment um, with my next little baby due in July, and so I am actually in the process of moving a lot of my work online, and so um, we've got some, we've got some drafts of the type 2 diabetes remission and pre-diabetes reversal online programs ready to go. And so they should be finished soon. And um, yeah, I'll be running some online programs shortly afterwards. So for today, type two diabetes remission, what will I actually be talking about? So we're going to talk very briefly um, about a few of the first few dot points there. So what is diabetes? What is remission? How do I diagnose diabetes and um, testing the blood glucose levels? The impact of different foods on blood glucose levels, um, that's really important and that's like the bulk of what I'll be talking about. Uh, what to eat, what to limit, what does a day on the plate look like, my own blood glucose level experiment and um, diet, dietary recommendations as well. So I'll jump straight in. I'm going to go through these first few slides quite quickly just because this is um, a lot of background information um, and I'm just trying to keep this simple and straightforward and um, I just want to get into the practical bits that you can actually implement in your life. So, But you, you need the background as well. So what is diabetes? So there's two main types of diabetes. There's type 1 and there's type 2. So type 1 diabetes is a condition in which the pancreas produces little or no insulin. And so insulin is a hormone in the body which is needed to allow sugar or glucose to enter the cells to produce energy for the body. So when you consume carbohydrate rich food, so carbohydrate rich food we'll talk about in a lot more detail in a moment, but that's things like your breads, rice, pastas, fruit, etc. So let's say you're having a piece of bread, um, it's carbohydrate rich, it goes down into your body, your body breaks it down, breaks the carbohydrates down into the most simple form which is glucose or um, sugar, so those two words can be used interchangeably. Um, when you've got glucose or sugar in your bloodstream, the pancreas comes along and produces insulin. And so that's a hormone. And that insulin is responsible of helping to remove the glucose from the bloodstream and taking it throughout the body to where it's needed so that your body can use it for energy. What happens with type 1 diabetes is you produce little or no insulin. And so therefore your blood glucose levels will continue to rise unless you inject insulin. With type 2 diabetes, it's a condition in which the pancreas does not produce enough insulin or the cells of the body are not actually responding to the insulin effectively. So that's known as insulin resistance. So to give you a bit of information there, so if you're, if you're consuming your piece of bread or a couple of bits of bread, whatever it is, let's say you've made a sandwich, um, and you've got type 2 diabetes, your body may not produce enough insulin. So as the bread is broken down into glucose and it goes into your bloodstream, it increases those blood glucose levels, your pancreas will be producing insulin, but it can't produce enough to bring the blood sugars down to the level that they need to be. Or the other, um, the other thing is insulin resistance, where your body may actually be pumping out the insulin and giving it a lot of insulin, but your body has become what's called insulin resistant. So it's not reacting to insulin in the same way. And as such, your blood glucose levels are remaining high. You're taking a lot more insulin than needed to bring it down. Now, what's the 
issue with that, well, one, if your body's absolutely pumping out the insulin, you can have what's called beta cell burnout. And um, so that's the beta cells of the pancreas. As they're producing insulin, they become fatigued over time. They may not be able to produce insulin um, anymore. And then you may require insulin injections. The other thing is insulin is lipogenic, meaning fat creating. So the more insulin that you've got in your body, and that's whether it's produced naturally by your pancreas or if you are injecting it, the more insulin your body needs, the more fat that your body will be creating as well. So making it harder to lose weight and also just making weight gain um, quite easy as well. A couple of facts about diabetes. So this is Australian research. So the research does suggest one in three adults have pre-diabetes. Pre-diabetes is your red flag before type 2. So if you've been diagnosed with pre-diabetes, it's kind of exciting because you can then just say, okay, great, it's my red flag. I have to do something so I don't go on to get type 2 diabetes. So it's a bit of a warning card there. Um, so one in three adults have pre-diabetes in Australia, but nine out of 10 don't actually know it. It's something I see in the clinic a lot. It's undiagnosed. People are coming in for something like weight loss and they've actually got pre-diabetes as well. And so it, it is a bit scary, that figure. Uh, type 2 diabetes it represents 85 to 90% of all cases of diabetes. Um, so it's obviously quite a high number and it is a prominent form of diabetes. It, type 2, it used to affect the more mature um, individuals. However, because of our sedentary lifestyle, because of our convenient foods that we're eating, um, because of so many different things in our Western society, it's now actually commonly seen in children and in adolescents, and that's really scary. Um, and one in every 20 Australians, um, Australian adults, has type 2 diabetes, and in America it's actually 1 in 10. So I want to talk to you about management versus remission. Excuse me. So management is, I guess, your more traditional Western way of thinking about diabetes. So it's where, when someone says, goes to the GP or gets diagnosed with diabetes, you're told, okay, you've got diabetes. Diabetes is a progressive disease. We'll manage it. But knowing that your symptoms will progress, your ability to control your own blood glucose levels will worsen over time. Therefore, we expect that you will be going on to oral medication, we'll delay for as long as possible, oral medication, and then eventually you'll need insulin as well. And so they look at management like, keep doing what you're doing, we'll manage it in the way that we can. Like they do encourage you to lose weight, which is wonderful. Um, however, it is looked at, okay, you've got this grim disease, let's manage it knowing things are going to get worse as time goes on. Remission, however, we're actually looking at it, okay, you've got type 2 diabetes, let's get those blood sugars, instead of being so high, let's bring them back down to normal levels through what you're doing in your lifestyle. So let's look at your nutrition, let's look at your um, exercise, maybe your stress or other things that are playing a role as well, but bring those blood sugar levels back down to regular normal levels. When, when we say normal levels, that just means um, diabetes, I mean, sorry, sugar levels of someone that doesn't have diabetes, so normal levels. And if you are on any medications, we want to reduce and once we're able to discontinue the use of all of your medications, um, diabetes related, that's when we can say, okay, um, you're in diabetes remission. And that is the coolest thing. It's so, so exciting when someone achieves that. I love it. Okay, symptoms of diabetes very quickly. So this is for anyone who's watching who goes, mm, I wonder, maybe I do, maybe I don't. So excessive thirst, frequent urination, uh, you're tired all the time, you're lethargic, and as such, most people then go for your carbohydrate-rich foods for a quick pick-me-up, a quick energy release, 
Um, so they'll get lots of energy, blood sugars come crashing back down and then they're tired again. Uh, frequent infection, so something like UTI, so urinary tract infection, really, really common. Um, blurred vision as the sugar affects all the blood vessels in your eyes. Loss of sensation, so in your periphery, so in your fingers, in your toes. Um, and then poor wound healing as well. So just when you're getting a cut, it's just taking longer to heal than what, what you know that it should do. These here are clinical signs of insulin resistance. So like we said, with type 2 diabetes, it's insulin resistant. So your body's just producing lots of insulin, but your body's not actually responding very well to the insulin that it is producing. So um, this is a bit of a tricky word. You don't have to learn how to say it. Acanthosis nigricans. And so that's like around the neck area, the back of the neck. You may have seen somebody with that. And it's the darkening of the skin pigment. And you can see what it looks like over there. Um, it's like a bit of a velvety change in texture as well. So something like that is definitely a clinical sign of insulin resistance. And a good reason to jump along to your GP just to say, hey, can we just screen for diabetes, please? Skin tags, um, so non-cancerous skin growths. Um, can be a sign of insulin resistance. Central obesity. So if you've got a high waist to hip ratio or high waist to thigh ratio or, or just a larger waist circumference, um, then that is a clinical sign of insulin resistance. And so you can calculate that by yourself if, if you would like to. And so just, I put the calculation there just to quickly explain it. It's your waist in centimeters. So grab a tape measure, pop it around your waist. So the smallest part of your body and read that in centimeters. And then do the same for your hips. And so your hips is generally about halfway down your bum and just take the reading over there. So you go your waist circumference in centimeters divided by your hip circumference in centimeters. For men, ideally we're wanting that to be 0.9 or less, ladies 0.8 or less. If it is higher, it just means that there's central obesity, so more fat around all of the organs in the body, therefore increasing insulin resistance, which may put you on the path for type 2. Um, this last one is the excess growth of facial hair, particularly on women. And so if you do have excess facial hair, it could just be um, genetics or it could be a sign of insulin resistance. And so it could be a good indication. Let's get checked out. Let's screen for diabetes. If you're being screened for diabetes, it's just doing um, a blood test like a fasting blood glucose level or um, what's called a HbA1c, which we'll talk about in a sec. Um, and that's just, and then you can rule diabetes out or if it is a sign and you do have diabetes or pre-diabetes, it's amazing to find out really, really soon because then you can start making changes and just put it into remission. So diagnosing diabetes, we've got the HbA1c, so that's a three-month reading of what your sugars have been doing in your blood. So that, that's a really, really great, um, a great reading because you can't, you can't cheat for that one. It's a three-month reading um, and it averages your sugars out. It, you could do a fasting blood glucose or a random blood glucose. So that's just a pathology test. Um, and if it is high, then they may just want to retest again. Or what's called the OGTT, so oral glucose tolerance test. You go off again to a path lab. They give you a sugary drink and then they just test your, um, they, they just take a few blood samples. And um, if your readings are high, then that's diagnostic of diabetes as well. So um, all, all these tests, it's pathology, um, so a little blood sample, quite non-invasive, um, and it, it is good to know. <laughs> the blood glucose level reference ranges. So for type 2, target levels according to standard Western sort of recommendations. I think this one was taken from um, ADA. And so it is around about 6.8 millimoles before meals for your blood sugars, 6 to 10 millimoles two hours after starting a meal. Those readings are actually quite high. A standard normal blood glucose range is between about four and eight. And so absolutely, if your readings are quite high above that at the moment, slowly work on bringing them down through what we'll talk about in the diet in a moment. 
and then get down to these recommendations, absolutely. And then afterwards, depending how you're going, you can work with somebody or do it by yourself. Bring them down further. You can go down to about four and average between about four and eight. So the six to ten I do find a little bit high, but um, each to their own there. So let's get into the diet side of things. So obviously a dietitian, um, this is where I really um, love to talk about it. And so there's three different macronutrients. There's carbohydrates, there's protein, and there's fat. Starting with carbohydrates. So carbohydrates, they're found in all of the foods here in this image. And so you've got your, your breads, your rice, cereals, pastas. You can see some fruit there. You can see some starchy veggies, so potatoes and corn. Excuse me. Um, you can see some beans, lentils, and legumes. Of course, like I said before, it's also your um, known sugary foods, so cakes and pastries and um, soft drink and juice and all the rest of that as well. But these are carbohydrate-rich foods. What happens when you're consuming carbohydrates is carbs are broken down into glucose, um, which is the most simple form. So this glucose increases your circulating blood glucose level. So the glucose, as it's broken down, it goes into your blood and it increases blood glucose levels. This, as a result, it increases production of insulin because that insulin wants to bring your blood glucose levels down. So your pancreas is going to be working hard to increase the production of insulin. Keeping in mind that insulin is lipogenic, meaning fat creating, which results in weight gain, and it also drives insulin resistance. So ideally we're wanting low levels of insulin as opposed to high levels of insulin. Any unused glucose is stored as fat. And so that's also really good to keep in mind. Like if you're having a high high amount of carbohydrates, all of it's broken down into glucose, and then you're not doing anything with that glucose, your body goes, no, don't worry, I'll, I'll store it as fat and you can use it for later. And so it's driving the insulin resistance and it's driving the weight gain. Um, and also if you're trying to lose weight, it makes it really hard to lose weight because you're constantly storing more and more as fat. And you, um, sorry, and then the last point there, over time, you do require more insulin to bring down the same amount of glucose as insulin resistance increases. So it's a bit of a cycle. A really easy way to think about diabetes is carbohydrate intolerance. And so for someone who's got diabetes or even pre-diabetes, your body isn't metabolizing carbohydrates effectively, not metabolizing it as it's meant to. And so if you think about it, if you've got a lactose intolerance, what you do is you reduce or you eliminate lactose. If you've got a wheat intolerance, you reduce or you eliminate wheat from your diet. If you've got a carbohydrate intolerance, it therefore only makes sense to reduce, you can eliminate if you want, it's quite hard, um, but to reduce the carbohydrate in your diet so you're not putting that much pressure on your body. When you bring your carbohydrates down, your pancreas doesn't have to work as hard to produce insulin. You don't have to produce as much insulin. It's easier to bring your blood sugar levels down. Um, it just has a flow on effect. So just thinking about diabetes as a carbohydrate intolerance, and if that's the only thing you take away from today, that's amazing. Because if we can treat diabetes as an intolerance to carbohydrates, you'll have incredible results. This here is a slide um, from Dr. David Unwin, and it's world, worldwide used. It's amazing. Um, and it just shows you because carbohydrates, like I've said, are broken down into glucose or sugar, um, they just show you here like, okay, how much, how many teaspoons of sugar is in these different foods. And I'll let you go through this at your own pace, um, just due to time. But like, if you have a look at the rice, that's about a cup of rice. That's 10 teaspoons of sugar. So if you were to have like curry and rice, for example, you're having your curry with 10 teaspoons of sugar. And you just think if you were to put 10 teaspoons of sugar in your cup of tea, like that's quite a lot. 
And that's only your one meal. And that's only one cup of rice. Lots of people have more than the one cup of rice. Whereas if you go down and you can see the broccoli, which is second from the bottom, if you were to go down and swap your rice from a standard rice over to like a broccoli or a cauliflower rice, and you were to still have like about a cup, you're having not even half a teaspoon of sugar. And so you've bought that down tenfold. And when you're doing that, your body doesn't have to produce all of that insulin. So you're not driving insulin resistance, you're not driving weight gain, you're not driving anything. It's just nourishing your body. And so that, that's a really, really great visual, um, which you can get from Dr. David Unwin if you jump on to his website, um, or else it's just everywhere as well. So that's carbohydrates. This here is protein. Now I'm going to just jump through protein and fat a lot more quickly. So protein is found in all of these types of foods. So it's, you've got your um, fish, beef, chicken, nuts and seeds, eggs, um, any poultry, dairy products. They're your main stepping stones for protein. Now protein has mild to no effect on your blood glucose level. So that means when you're consuming a piece of salmon, it's pretty much not going to touch your blood glucose. It's not going to be right, um, raising your blood glucose levels at all. And that's the same when it comes to fat. Fat pretty much has zero effect on blood glucose. And in fact, fat can actually decrease the absorption rate of blood glucose when you're having a carbohydrate rich food, which I'll go into in a moment because um, that might be confusing. So with the fat, we're talking about natural dietary fat. We're not talking about your vegetable oils or your margarines or your deep fried foods. We're talking about avocados and nuts and seeds and salmon. We're talking about the fat, having the fat on your meat, having the skin on your chicken. Um, we're, we're talking about eggs and having the fat in the egg yolk. We're talking about just these beautiful natural dietary fats that are so, so important um, for you. And they're satiating, so they're actually going to fill you up, whereas carbs, you consume them, you feel great, they give you a big energy hit, and then they drop you, and you're lethargic. Whereas fats, they'll satiate you, they'll fill you up, so therefore you don't have to eat as much longer term. Um, and then, of course, they've got that effect with the, um, with the blood glucose levels to help bring them down as well. So when we're having a look at like um, diabetes remission, we used to say reverse diabetes, uh, reverse type 2, but um, that word's a little bit to and fro. But anyway, so we're sticking with remission. This is an um, image that, again, from Dr. David Unwin, such a clever man, and it was just reproduced by Coastal Dietetics. So I've just taken it from there. Um, but pretty much when you have a look at it, given the information that we just spoke about with carbohydrates, fats, and protein, when you reduce your carbohydrate intake, because carbs are broken down into glucose and you're needing insulin to bring your glucose levels down, so you reduce carbohydrate intake, it automatically reduces the amount of circulating insulin in your body. When you've got a reduction of circulating insulin, this results in a reduction of pancreas fat and in liver fat. So there's not as much fat around those um, important um, organs. And it makes it easier for you to lose weight because like we said, insulin is lipogenic. So we don't have as much insulin in our body. It makes it easier to lose weight. When we've got a reduction of pancreas fat, so the pancreas is what produces insulin, so there's not as much fat surrounding the pancreas, therefore we can have increased insulin secretion. So your body can produce insulin more effectively. And when you've got a reduction of the liver fat and you're able to lose weight, a reduction of um, fat in the body, it reduces insulin resistance, meaning that your body when your body's actually producing insulin, your body's actually able to respond better to it. When you've got those two combined, you've, you're responding well to the insulin and your body's producing insulin well as well, you're able to put type 2 diabetes into remission, just meaning you're able to keep those blood glucose levels at a normal, normal level and um, you won't have to take the medications or the insulin injections. So, 
I, I love that slide just because it really makes things sound so easy and that's a really really cool thing is that it is it is so so easy um, to to do and so hopefully I'll be able to help you make some changes so let's have a look at okay what can you actually eat and what is best to limit now I use the word limit I don't use the word avoid because who wants a life where you're avoiding everything for the rest of your life so just limit it um, and then mostly choose from the things that you can eat so when we're coming to look at what should I be limiting it's your carbohydrate rich foods you've got a carbohydrate intolerance we need to bring them down what can I enjoy literally everything else and people go oh my gosh there's nothing else left and there is we'll go through that so what to actually limit um, your carb rich foods so it's all the ones that we discussed before so breads rice pasta cereal fruit we'll talk about don't stress starchy veggies beans and lentils and so these are the foods that are broken down into glucose raise your blood glucose levels and therefore will cause more insulin resistance weight gain um, store um, all of the unused glucose as fat xyz you progress on to get more and more complications with your diabetes if you choose to eat lots of these foods if you choose to limit them that's when we're able to reduce your glucose reduce insulin and everything else that we've spoken about so I won't hash on about it so okay if you're avoiding all of those foods or limiting them what can I eat literally like I said before everything else um, this image here is really great it's from diet doctor if you haven't jumped on that jump on there they've got um, so much information about diabetes on there and they got so much information about what can I eat what should I um, best to limit lots and lots of great information this was just a great picture that I took from there so um, so everything else so your meat your eggs your seafood so all of your protein rich foods eat them have them also with the fat on them so when you've got your meat have your mince as a regular mince as opposed to lean mince have the have the fat on your pork chop have the have the fat as it comes with the food because we want the fat um, have your eggs there's no limitation on eggs there used to be six eggs a week there's no limitation on that um, and enjoy your seafood uh, nuts and seeds really really good all of your non starchy veggies so yeah sure we're going to be limiting potato corn and peas all your others go for gold and so people will often come to a bit of a mind blank like what other veggies exist so that's all of your salad veggies it's your broccoli cauliflower cabbage um, capsicum zucchini eggplant tomatoes asparagus broccolini um, all of your Asian veggies like your bok choy san choy um, Brussels sprouts there are so so many different veggies so go into the veggie aisle have a look at all of them and actually buy a few different things each time because if we can increase that that's amazing fats and oils really good so again not your margarines not your veggie oils we're talking about butters and olive oil coconut oil we're talking about those more natural types of fat um, if you're choosing to have dairy full cream dairy so not the low fat stuff full cream dairy a hundred percent um, and then if you're wanting to have some fruit especially all of us here in Queensland um, aiming more so for your lower carb fruit whenever possible otherwise aiming for a maximum of say one serve of fruit a day so zero to one serve of fruit a day so your lower carb fruit is things like your berries so strawberries blueberries blackberries kiwi fruit papaya limes if you like limes as well so aiming more for your lower carb fruit when you can you go okay great that's all well and good but what does that look like in a meal so let's have a look at okay a day on the plate so let's go through brekkie lunch and dinner some snack ideas and some little sweetie treaties as well because we can't forget those so brekkie we're looking at more of your egg based products so um, an egg based brekkie is something like an omelette or poached eggs with avocado 
or maybe fried eggs with mushrooms and asparagus or maybe you want to make like a little frittata or egg and bacon cupcakes so making use of eggs you may find if you're used to having eggs on toast, like having two eggs isn't enough because we don't really want the bread there. So you may find, okay, now I'm actually going to have four eggs and that's fine. That's no problem. I eat four to five eggs a day at the moment and um, it's delicious. Um, nuts or seed based. And so that's having a look at something like a chia seed pudding. Um, or maybe it's a little bit of uh, full fat Greek yogurt. But then the important thing is you top it with your protein and your fat. So you're topping it with coconut shards, your nuts, your seeds to make sure that it's not all like a full fat Greek yogurt. It does have the carbohydrates in there, but we're wanting to compensate with protein and fats in there to bring down the, um, the reaction for the glucose. A smoothie is another great option, so it might be like a raspberry and coconut cream smoothie. Super duper simple. It might be more based on, excuse me, it might be more based on things like your nuts and seeds. So having um, almonds thrown in there, having some peanut butter, maybe a coconut cream or some, some other type of milk in there. And really, maybe you've got an avocado going in there. So having a smoothie is another really great option. You could use leftovers. You don't have to have the traditional brekkie food. Um, and so if you had, I don't know, steak and salad for dinner, have, um, have that as your, have that as your um, brekkie the next day. Or if you've got a stew, have that for brekkie or a casserole, whatever it is, have your leftovers for your breakfast. The other thing, not enough time to talk about today, maybe another day, is fasting. So doing a fast 16-8 or the OMAD fast, um, which is one meal a day, having a look into that. Like I say, I won't talk about it today. There are a few bits and bobs if you are on insulin, um, where if you all of a sudden start fasting, it'll drop your blood glucose quite low. Um, so you need to be careful. So um, just have a read into fasting. Um, and then obviously, if you need assistance, sing out, we're happy to help. Okay, lunch or dinner. So we're looking at meat and veggies or meat and salad. Um, so fish and chips, for example. So with your fish and chips, um, it would just be something like grilled fish. And then with the chips, it could be like green beans is what we use a lot in our house. Just steam the green beans, fry them off in some butter, add some salt and some slivered almonds. Really tasty. My little two-year-old loves them. Um, or it might be asparagus spears, it might be beetroot chips, it might be zucchini chips. So um, any of those, they're amazing. Naked burger, so that's the burger without the buns. So you can use field mushrooms for the buns or you can use lettuce leaves for the buns. Amazing, so, so delicious. Um, Mexican bowl, so that's anything like your nachos or your tacos or your enchiladas, anything like that. But just take off the um, the wrap or the taco shell or the nacho chips and just have everything else in a bowl and top it up with your guacamole and your salsa and your sour cream and everything else because it's all amazing but we're just not wanting so much carbohydrate so you may want to serve that also with some spinach or something at the bottom um, lasagna or spaghetti bolognese so going old school very very common in standard families um, and so again, instead of the lasagna sheets, we would be using something like eggplant slices or zucchini slices. Um, spaghetti bolognese, replacing the spaghetti part with, um, you can either get a low carb noodle, but honestly, they're as processed as spaghetti anyway. A good stepping stone. Or you can get um, a spiralizer and just spiralize your own zucchini and have zucchini noodles, so green noodles. Um, and for children, it is actually really fun. Lots of people go, oh, my kids would never eat that. But it's green noodles. Like, it is really fun. And when you are able to put that forward to a child, like, we're having green noodles or we're having um, purple lasagna sheets or something. Like, it is exciting for them. And so just think about how you um, propose these changes to your family because yeah, it can make a huge difference whether you say we're going to have vegetable spaghetti or green spaghetti. Anyway, um, steak and salad, 
nice and simple. So those are your lunch and dinners. If you're looking for sweet treats, dark chocolate um, is a really great place to go. Something like cinnamon roasted macadamia. So macadamias, fry them up in a pan, a little bit of butter if you want, some cinnamon on top. A chia seed pudding using vanilla essence or some cinnamon or nutmeg to sweeten it up. Strawberries and whipped cream, really delicious. Um, nice cream. So that is just pretty much homemade ice cream. And so it's just, for example, blueberries and coconut cream blended together and pop that into the freezer or have it immediately. And it's amazing. And then we've got snacks. So if you are wanting to snack, when you're eating this way, you don't snack very much. You're not hungry. You have more energy, your cravings disappear, you're satiated through the day. And so most people tend not to snack, but initially you may want to snack or hey, you may love to snack and continue and that's totally fine as well. So we're looking at things like your mixed nuts and seeds, um, cheese, cherry tomatoes, maybe some green beans with hummus or sugar snap peas with hummus. Um, you can have like an anti-pasta board, so cheese, olives, some dried tomatoes, maybe you want to put on there um, some salami or something. Um, so all of that won't affect your blood glucose. Parmesan crisps, so delicious, so expensive when you buy them commercially, so cheap when you make them at home, and so easy. Boiled eggs are a great option, so you can do like curried eggs, or I literally just take a boiled egg and eat it as is. Um, biltong or jerky, really, really great as well. Okay, I just want to talk to you about my own blood glucose level experiment. So I don't have diabetes and this experiment was obviously just a one man band. And so um, there's, yeah, there's obviously that as a huge limitation, but the, this is, I, I grabbed a continuous glucose monitor award on my arm for two weeks. I did a few tests and I conducted and I just looked at the results. So the first thing I looked at was the Australian dietary guidelines uh, versus a low carb approach. So remember type 2 diabetes, carbohydrate intolerance, therefore reduce your carbohydrate. So it comes out being low carbohydrate. Um, the Australian dietary guidelines is what a standard dietitian would be recommending. And so it's having a look at um, like for, for the standard recommendations, it's three to four serves of carbohydrates per meal. So brekkie lunch, dinner, one to two serves at morning tea, afternoon tea, maybe dessert as well. You land up with having about 200 to 250 odd grams of carbohydrates per day, which when you break that down, oh, I should have done this in ahead of time. Um, if you, you work it out, so 200 divided by four. And so, yeah, so 50. So it lands up being about 50 teaspoons of sugar per day that the standard recommendations are. And that's where we say, okay, cool. Keep having your carbohydrates throughout the day as your body is no longer able to produce enough insulin or as insulin resistance um, is just sky high, we'll give you some medication to make your body more sensitive to insulin. And when that's no longer working, we'll give you some insulin shots. And so it is that progressive sort of mindset. And so um, with the ADG meal plan, you can see what I ate there. It was um, your standard wheat bix with skim milk, a bit of fruit for brekkie, fruit for morning tea, um, a ham, cheese and salad sandwich for lunch, some toast with butter for afternoon tea. It should have been margarine actually for um, ADG guidelines. Um, and then for dinner, I had rice, vegetables and some lean meat. And then for dessert, I had some condensed milk. Um, and so that was just me meeting all of my dietary recommendations based on this is the amount of carbs I need per meal, as well as this is the amount of whole grains I need. This is the amount of fruit I need. This is the amount of veggies I need. So this is like a standard, this is everything that the ADG recommends for me um, that I consumed. And you can see the breakdown there. Carbohydrates are landed up at like, 300, uh, sorry, 230 grams of carbs, 65 for protein and 22 for fat. Whereas when you look on the right hand side, my low carb meal plan where I was having my eggs with butter for brekkie, meat and veggies and macadamias for lunch, potato and beetroot chips just done in the oven for afternoon tea and meat and salad for dinner. There's not much snacking going on, no dessert because you don't feel like it. You can actually see there my carbs were only 35 grams 
versus 230 and my fat was 90 grams versus 22 so so much more fat so much less carbohydrate um, and the same amount of calories interestingly for anyone who goes oh I don't want to eat fat because of so many calories similar amounts of calories between these two meal plans except the low carb I just felt full satiated no energy up and energy down like it was just a lovely stable day anyway um, these are the results so on the left hand side we've got the Australian dietary guidelines and you can see I was going up and down um, like a roller coaster and I'd eat some food my blood sugars would shoot up they come crashing down it would be time for another meal my blood sugars would go up come down another meal up down up down and I was just up and down all day long and you can see my average blood glucose was about 6.8 millimoles um, whereas when I was on my low carb you can see my blood sugars were a lot more stable throughout the day they got a much smaller sort of um, disparity between top and bottom and so my average blood glucose was closer to 4.9 so that's a whole two millimoles lower which in, di in the diabetes world is absolutely phenomenal so that's amazing um, and so that's the difference between standard recommendations versus a low carb approach I then also had a look at different brekkie options just to see the effect of sugars you can see wheat bix brought my sugars up to eight keeping in mind the lower the better for sugars so wheat bix brought my sugars up to eight uh, rolled oats was 7.1 nutri grain was 8.7 so that was the highest one carmen's granola so everyone knows carmen's as like your great healthy option was 8.1 millimoles and you look at cocoa pops the next door to carmen's there and cocoa pops was only 7.9 and so carmen's actually and that's the five five grains and seed granola um brought my sugars up higher and if I were just to have cocoa pops like it's crazy and then of course I did my standard eggs and butter and um, only up to 5.5 so a whole two and a half three millimole less if I'm just having some eggs and some butter as opposed to bombarding my system with cereals and skim milk and maybe a bit of fruit or something so really 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 interesting especially um, yeah for someone who's got diabetes and you're struggling in the morning with oh my gosh by morning tea my sugars are just so high consider what you're having for brekkie and like we said consider a nut based brekkie or an egg based brekkie or some leftovers as opposed to the traditional cereals because cereals are carbohydrates diabetes is carbohydrate intolerance this over here is just having a quick look at chai latte on an empty stomach versus after having um, some fat and so the top one is when I had nothing I just a chai latte so um, it's just like a sugary drink for people who don't drink coffee so it's essentially like a hot chocolate um, and my blood sugar shot up to 12 which is really really high when the next day I did it again um, except this time I had egg, bacon and avo so no bread or anything like that just egg, bacon and avo and I had my chai latte so I just had something in my tummy but like how I was saying before with the fat it really just um, brings down the effect of your blood glucose and you can see it was pretty much half of um, what it was as opposed to having it on an empty stomach so I only went up to 6.6 this I was able to show again through eating dates so again really really sugary so I had four dates sugars went up to 7.9 and then the following day I had the four dates but I put some fat in there so I used peanut butter just as a um, as something quick and easy two tablespoons of peanut butter and my sugars only went to 6.9 so a whole millimole difference and again that's the difference between being on some medication and not being on medication and the lower we can get these readings the better um, and then also keeping in mind the lower your sugars are the less insulin you require therefore the less um, fat you're storing the less we're driving insulin resistance xyz it's just literally a nice flow on effect I'm just going to finish off here with my own recommendations that I encourage people to follow um, and so I'll go through them and then um, I'll wrap it up for you guys so sugar 
um, being carbohydrates, reduce your carbohydrates significantly. If they aren't too high at the moment, then reduce them. But pretty much um, we're aiming for about 80 to 100 grams of carbohydrates for a standard individual. For a lot of people, it can be quite a bit lower. Um, if you've been following this for a while, it might be quite a bit lower. Um, you may want to look more into a ketogenic approach, but honestly, 80 to 100 grams of carbohydrates per day is so, so good. Lots of room for protein, lots of good healthy fats. Fruit, aiming for zero to one serve per day, preferably low carb fruit. Limit or avoid your breads, rice, potato, and your pastas. Your non-starchy veggies, eat as much as you like, preferably at least five serves per day. And those are all of the veggies that we went over before. Your proteins, enjoy a serve of protein with each meal and ensure that you meet your minimum requirements. In clinic, most people are low in their protein. They're just not getting enough protein and we need the protein there. And so to work out your own requirements, you go 1.2, excuse me, 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilo of body weight. So for someone who's about 100 kilos, we're looking for 120 to 160 grams of protein per day. Now, if you don't know what 120 grams of protein looks like, grab, um, grab an app on your phone where you can just track it just for a few days. You don't have to do it for long. Just so then you get a good idea of, okay, cool, I'm getting about 80 grams of protein per day. I need to increase it by 30%. And that makes a huge difference over time. So definitely make sure you're getting enough protein. Fats, don't be afraid of fats. Enjoy your natural dietary fats and avoid low fat foods. Please absolutely avoid them. I did a talk last year for this conference on um, dietary fats. And so, um, yeah, have a look at that if you're wanting to know a bit more information and research around that. Um, and I'll give you the link for that shortly. Sweeteners, they can trick your brain into feeling more hungry. It is best to limit or to avoid them. Um, I don't use them personally in my own home. Um, it can be a good stepping stone, but longer term, I wouldn't recommend them. Alcohol, for those who um, do drink quite a lot of alcohol, keeping in mind beer is liquid toast. Limit your mixes, so like mixing it with Coke or orange juice or something like that, because that's where all the sugars are. And your spirits and your wines are preferable, providing it's not a dessert wine. Um, there's a few other bits and bobs with alcohol, um, just in regards to alcohol being metabolized in preference to glucose. And so it can just have an effect on how your body responds to carbohydrates when you're drinking alcohol. Snacks, there's no real need. Just because you feel full when you're eating this way, you feel full, you feel satiated. So most people find they don't need snacks. If you do want to have snacks completely fine, just choose a real food satiating option like what we went through before. And then fasting, trial it. Um, if you're super anti it, just do it as an experiment for a few weeks, see how you go. Most people love it and get incredible results. The resources, um, these are currently on my website, so kellyhodges.com.au. So it's got the full um, presentation for my blood glucose level experiment. Um, also for the dietary fats presentation that I did last year. It's also got the four steps to low carb success ebook, which you can just download there. There's um, no charge to that one. And then for this year, um, what I'm putting up for you guys is a food list. So what can I eat um, in order to put my diabetes into remission? So there'll be a food list there for you guys. Then also, um, like those online programs that I was talking about. So we're in the process of doing a type 2 diabetes remission program and a pre-diabetes reversal program. It's all online. You get all of the support and resources and guidance that you that you need like we're there to help you and so with that um, they should be up quite soon and so um, you can go onto the website kellyhodges.com.au and um, sign up so that you get the discount code and so when the programs go live then it automatically applies your discount and you're ready to rock and roll and so I'm very excited about those ones.
Guys, that's it from me. Thank you so, so much for listening. I hope that you got something from that. And so I'm Kelly Hodges, um, and you can find out any information about me on kellyhodges.com.au. And, um, yeah, I wish you all the absolute best with your health and well-being. Thank you.